Hello and welcome to Community Matters, a podcast from the Canadian Association of Community Health Centres. I'm your host, Hilary Leblanc. On this episode of the podcast, I am speaking with Juanita Lawson, Chief Executive Officer from Norwest Community Health Centre based in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Norwest CHCs provide a wide range of health and social services geared to the diverse needs of individuals, families, and groups in the Thunder Bay area and other northern communities. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Good. Um, First off, if you wouldn't mind telling me a bit more about uh, Norwest CHC and some of the main aspects of your organization, the communities you serve, and the services and programs that you provide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be pleased to do so. So Norwest Community Health Centres is situated on top of uh, Lake Superior, and we're about 18 hours uh, drive away from Toronto for people in terms of their context and eight hours from Winnipeg. And so the Norwest Community Health Centres is one of one CHC uh, within the city of Thunder Bay. And uh, we're a not-for-profit organization. We have been established for approximately 30 years, moving on to that. And one of the, um, we're a community governed organization where we have a board of uh, 10 individuals who are representative of the community and the populations that we serve. And in terms of our, we are, we have a site in Thunder Bay and then we also have two sites that are located about three hours away from the city of Thunder Bay and more rural organization, rural communities, which is in um, Armstrong and Longlack. And we have uh, sites there and as well, uh, which I will talk about a little bit later, is we have a mobile health services team that actually offers offers, offers service in many rural communities uh, in the district of Thunder Bay as well. So as an organization, I would say we are like many CHCs, multifaceted, uh, very diverse in terms of the services that we provide. One of the very key uh, important things for us as an organization is really looking at uh, the population needs of the communities that we're serving and really focusing on our vision, mission and values in terms of how we make decisions about care and how we provide those care. So that care and, and, and of course, One of the great things about a community health center is that the integrated uh, care team that we have is very diverse in terms of their skill set, but also very diverse in terms of um, the services that we offer. So, for example, some of the services that we have in terms of our our CHC and where we're situated is uh, we do a lot of, uh, so at our Thunder Bay site, I would say is one of our, is the largest site of the three So we have services that, uh, so while we have a primary healthcare team that has nurses and nurse practitioners and uh, and nurses and dietitians and therapists, we also have community health workers, which many people also call system navigators, Uh, but our community health workers are really a key part of our integrated care team in terms of the work they do to support individuals uh, in the community. And our Um, the other care team members that we have. So we have our primary care team and then the other services that we, or clinics I would say are more specialized is our fetal alcohol spectrum spectrum disorder clinic. So we're one in Northern Ontario and the uh, diagnostic clinics are very, becoming more and more rare. Um, And we service not only Northern Ontario, but many of the First Nations communities. Uh, And in the geography of uh, Northern Ontario as well. And then we also have um, our pilot of care link program and and many of these programs that I'm speaking about are very, are lots of multiple, lots of organizations and partners. And so not only local, but regional partners. So our pilot of care link program uh, serves individuals who are piloted. And that's again, a a really beautiful partnership with um, many of our community partners. And then we have our rapid access addiction medicine clinic, which we have five partners, again, that looking at uh, addiction medicine, we've been offering that for the past three years, and we are going to be expanding out into the region. Uh, And so that's one of the things around many of these services as well, we start local, we also look at how we can branch out into the community, um, into the district where there's not a lot of uh, services available. And then we also have, we've been fortunate to have um, midwives. We have two midwives who work with us and 
Uh, so while you know in in Thunder Bay there's a real need for midwifery care, our midwives really focus on focus on working with um, women who are in need. So they might be involved in a rapid access addiction medicine clinic, or they might be uh, accessing some of our other harm reduction services. But it's it's mostly for individual women at at, at higher risk. And then we have um, some of the other things that I'm we're really pleased about is our consumption and treatment uh, program, which started a few years ago. We call it Path Five to Five, and that program has continued to grow, uh, as well as our focus on really embedding harm reduction services in everything that we do. And I would say, as a community health center, that's uh, probably over the past couple of years that's been very significant. Our investment in engaging with um, harm reduction workers who have lived experience and through multiple funding, uh, significant funding we've received in different streams, taking a look at how we can really integrate um, individuals who have that lived experience into our organization to shed light on what we need to do different around stigma, discrimination, anti-oppressive anti practice, and really be focused on um, the reducing as many barriers to care that we can, uh, given that there are so many barriers uh, that people have experienced through COVID. So I think the other, the other things that we have done, and, and probably we'll speak about this a little bit later, is Northern Ontario is great in terms of the, the partnerships that we have and the connections that we have, just because you need to rely on each other and you need to be able to pick up the phone and, and speak to another organization and do you know look at how we might be able to do things different. And I would say that through the pandemic, that has been very significant uh, in terms of really strengthening and just validating that those relationships have been really you know pivotal and, and really important in terms of some of the work that we do. And I think you know as well with our mobile community health teams that go out and serve, you know, provide primary care and, and diabetes services to communities in the District of Thunder Bay and our rural communities. It's really focused on uh, providing care where people are at and not making any assumptions that people have the capacity or the ability to get into, you know, Thunder Bay and receive foot care services or, you know, um, so that whole really focusing on people in, in place has been really important for us in terms of some of the work that we do. And I think uh, if anything, you know, our organization and our team, our staff have been, um, you know, they, we've, they've really stretched in terms of uh, coming into our organization as staff members and, and really doing a lot of very creative work, uh, but also work that has really stretched them in terms of their own learning. So, uh, you know, you, we don't, people don't come into our organization and, and be in an office. They're, they come into our organization and they're um, engaged in the work that we do at Shelter House or at the Managed Alcohol Program or um, doing outreach. So those are things that I think have really allowed people to connect with the community, but also allowed us to really develop service in a very different way and in a model that's very different than, um, than other practices, I would say. That's amazing. Uh, the work you guys are doing is phenomenal. And uh, you did give me the perfect segue when you mentioned your, your mobile services and meeting people where they're at, which is, you know, such a crucial part of the work that community health centers do. Because the populations you serve are so widespread and across some of the more rural and remote areas of Northern Ontario, I was going to ask, although you did give a little snippet, um, what are some of the ways that you have made care um, and support more accessible? And if you could help our audience and listeners better understand some of the particular challenges that you face being in those Northern communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it has been, I think our model of care and our decisions about how we provide care uh, really, again, have been embedded in um, a, a framework of trying to be where people are at and reaching out and engaging people where they're at and where they live. And so I think the mobile health services is an example of that, uh, where our health team will uh, drive an hour and a half, set up a clinic in a, whether it's a community center, a local community center, or a municipal office building, or those type of things, and then they provide primary health care and diabetes care uh, in that way, and, and they travel to those communities. 
and you know i think as well with just what our what our mandate is as an organization i think in terms of who we serve in our populations which is really focused on more of a um, with our vulnerable or at risk or seniors potentially who are you know more isolated um, or even taking a look at women who are involved in the in sex trade sex trade work has been really important for us and as well the engagement with individuals who uh, might have mental health and addictions has really been an important focus for us i would also say and i was remiss in mentioning that um, we also have been also have developed a, a significant um, offering in terms of uh, trans care services uh, for individuals for LGBTQ, but also for 2S, but also for trans care clients who are looking for transitioning. So we have a, a fair number of healthcare providers that offer that service. But I think in terms of, um, you know, in our northern communities, you know, I would say some of the challenges has been, I mean, our communities and, you know, maybe across the province is there's been a significant challenge with regards to the economy in terms of how communities are faring with regards to employment. Uh, and it has actually, you know, our, our data for individuals who reside in the north is not great. We have very uh, high, -ish, high um, uh, you know, rates of chronic disease, our opioid rates, uh, while we were talking about COVID-19 through the pandemic, there was, uh, again, a lot of concern raised for the fact that individuals were continuing to die as a result of overdose and the opioid crisis, which is, you know, we've been continuing to advocate for. Uh, but I think as well across our province and probably across Canada, the issue which is loud and clear for CHCs is really the issues of housing and lack of affordable housing and emergency shelters for individuals who, who are struggling with the basic social determinants of health. So I think those are challenges that we're facing and as well, you know, mental health and addictions is continues to be prevalent for many of us in the north. Uh, and then I would say from an organizational point of view, we do see a lot of social isolation um, in many of our communities and we do see a lot of um, concern for the future around recruitment and retention. Uh, for our staff, uh, but also just knowing that individuals in rural and remote communities are more isolated with a lot of young people leaving some of those communities. And that's not new, uh, but that is something that, um, again, places seniors, you know, and individuals who are aging uh, in more of a difficult and compromised situation. Wonderful. Um... I wanted to ask, because you did mention before, and so we'll get more into this now, you've been operating uh, mobile services for years at Norwest CHC. Uh, can you tell me more about how these services have evolved over time and the benefits your community has seen because of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, our mobile health team, I think, like I mentioned, connecting with the community because many of our engagement and going in communities that initially was established with a with a, almost an agreement and a partnership with those communities that they would support uh, the work of those communities and uh, and support the work of the mobile health team. I think, like I mentioned, um, offering services close to home has been really valued. Uh, and I think, you know, in terms of some of the evolution that we've seen around the mobile uh, health care team is we, when I first started here, we were paper charting and we were, our staff were hauling charts and trying to organize it and get it into the mobile van and, and then bring it out and then bring them all back. And, and so the, some of the evolution for us has been about technology, but, uh, you know, as much as we have been able to move to an electronic medical record system, we also know that and have experienced uh, just the, the issues of digital technology and access to Wi-Fi and bandwidth and, and still some of our remote um, rural communities where the mobile health services go, uh, you know, being able to chart as well in an electronic medical record system is, is still uh, very, very difficult. So, you know, while I, while that's, um, we still are continuing to plug away at it, one of the benefits of being able to do that, it's allowed us to shift some of the services at our mobile health communities, knowing, you know, looking at the ebb and flow and the transition of people in and out of some of those rural communities and 
having better access to data in terms of what the needs are and whether we're seeing more issues of diabetes or more foot care needs. It's allowed us to shift our staff and the resources to some of those communities and or transition some services out, for example, if I would say dietitian, if there wasn't a lot of uh, interest or engagement around dietary, you know, a dietitian on the mobile health, we either look at revamping uh, that role, or we look at how we might be able to increase engagement with those communities, uh, or we look at shifting that service in a different way. So I think that's one of the benefits of being able to have access to, te to technology and has allowed us to be a little very accountable and, and um, use, our, use our resources wisely. You also brought this up, but it would be impossible to have one of these episodes during a pandemic without talking about it. Um, serving northern rural and remote communities during COVID-19 has certainly added even more challenges and layers of complexity. What has your experience been during the pandemic and how has your community health center adapted to these challenges? Um, I would say our staff have been remarkable. Um, we, you know, we didn't think we would still be here two years later talking about a temp pandemic. Um, so I'd say that, you know, initially, especially when things closed very quickly, um, you know, we, and it, there was just a lot of unknowns and a lot of fear. So we did transition like many community health centers of our staff, many of our staff working from home or, uh, you know, or having a, a hybrid model where people would work from home or, or come into the office. Uh, but I would say that, you know, in terms of how we shifted and provided care is we engaged very quickly with um, looking at how our community health workers, for example, to in, could engage with individuals who are socially isolated. And so they were doing calls I can't recall how many, but um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of calls to all of our clients to say, how are you, what do you need? And to identify whether there was issues that they needed support with food or resources or connection or um, just a phone call to do a check-in. And so those that we shifted to that very quickly. And as well, we also uh, received a lot of uh, support through funding and donate funding that we applied for to provide not only emergency support and food, uh, but also to you know, provide personal protective equipment and uh, harm reduction supplies or um, warm clothing if people needed that. Uh, and then also we um, really looked at also trying to find access to phones and digital technology for individuals who were socially isolated and didn't have any access to those types of things. Uh, so we did that and then we also did a lot of, we shifted a lot of our services as well out into the community. So for example, our Path 525 staff, uh, where we were, you know, there was a lot of confusion initially when the pandemic started of, you know, we're open and then we're closed and then no, everything's closed. So it was, you know, just knowing that there was a lot of confusion and fear, right? And so we were also seeing people not come into Path 525 the supervised injection service and and so we uh, engaged our team to go out and reach out to individuals and to say we're open you need to come in and we had a nurse that actually was going out with um, one of our harm reduction outreach workers to connect with people who um, might be needing services and so whether it's wound care or flu shots or those type of things but just talk about safety and also just sharing information about COVID-19 and and um, precautions to take so you know, those are some of the things that we did. And I would say that um, we also through the pandemic, you know, it was it's it was a very complex time for for many of us, not only as leaders, but also for frontline workers. Uh, but it was also a very complex time for our community. And so there was a lot of really fantastic engagement with our community partners around pandemic planning and supporting each other and you know, offering vaccination clinics and um, many of our staff uh, were engaged in vaccinating in many, many locations, such as, uh, you know, some of our low income housing and at shelter house, for example, or, you know, looking at some of our areas where um, uh, individuals congregate that may not be connected to services. So there was a lot of engagement that way around vaccination clinics and many of our staff worked frontline to do a lot of that work. 
That's amazing. Um, and now, as you said, we're approaching the two-year anniversary. It's just right around the corner of this pandemic. And I'm, I'm curious how things look now for your community health center and what types of challenges and priorities are front and center now in comparison to, as you mentioned, when all of this started and everything was much more locked down and closed. Mm -hmm. I would, I would say, you know, front and center for us that we continue to see is just the inequities that exist in our communities. And, um, you know, we know that digital technology and, and access to virtual care is going to continue to be an important part of how we offer service. I think, you know, for us, a, not a, a, there's an opportunity and a challenge about how we might be able to embrace that because there are some benefits to that but also really just continuing to focus on the equity issues around you know, the fact that many people don't have access uh, to digital technology or Wi-Fi or data. And, and we've seen that through you know, some of our initiatives with you know, the, Life, the Lifeguard Digital Health app that we've been rolling that out as a pilot project for the last year. And we know that um, while it's, a, it's an app that people can download to you know, have immediate um, access to emergency medical services if they're experiencing an overdose. We also know that many of our individuals who use our PATH 525 site don't have a cell phone and they don't have data. So those are things I think we still need to continue to struggle with and, um, and sort of be mindful of from an advocacy point of view. I would say, you know, some of our, some of our challenges are going to continue to be not only from an organizational point of view, health and human resources, and just the, uh, you know, what our staff have experienced through this. Um, you know, they have families and, and lives, and we've, uh, um, we've leaned on them a lot to really, you know, move with us through this really challenging time and to really shift a lot in terms of um, how we offer services. And so I think that's been challenging for them, but I also you know, appreciate that we are in a very privileged position that we have been able to be employed and, and we have been able to go to our homes. And so, you know, we always, it's just being mindful of there are so many individuals who didn't have that. So they weren't able to go into a coffee shop because they didn't have a phone to show that they had a vaccine passport. So, you know, we carry a lot of privilege with, the, with this, with us being able to be involved in a CHC and uh, continuing to operate through a pandemic. Uh, so I think, you know, but we are starting to see, you know, and just be, have to be cognizant of that mental health and wellness in our communities, uh, not only around addiction issues and, 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 you know, a continuing opioid crisis, uh, but that the wellness of our communities, I think has been really shaken. And, um, you know, those, the opportunity to connect with each other and engage in a meaningful way has also been really challenging. And I think, you know, I, you know, words I continue to think about is rebuild, reconnect, re-engage, because we, it's like starting from scratch in terms of all of these relationships again, that are really important that, you know, allow us be to, to be connected to our community. Um, I think, you know, some of our challenges are continue to be, will continue to be the you know, how do we continue to take a look at the issue of affordable and safe housing uh, for individuals? And, and how do we support individuals in place and not just with a home, but with the services that need to wrap around them so that they can, you know, have the, have the opportunity to really embrace what it means to be, to, to have a home and to have that for a long period of time. And I think, you know, we've been, um, you know, it's, I think the pandemic has really shed light on many of the inequities that we have in our, in our um, communities. And I think as a community, as in the North, uh, as I mentioned earlier with our community partners, we've been really able to um, shift some of our resources very quickly in collaboration with each other. Uh, but it has also raised for us the need for some of the basic foundations of our of our social social structure I think has been really challenged and uh, so I think there's going to be some opportunities moving forward around what does it mean to be really equitable what does that really mean in terms of providing care in that way and then also you know social determinants of health what does that really mean 
uh, when you are looking at who's in front of you and who you're providing care to and, and how are you continuing to focus on all of those other aspects of their life that are really important to really engage with them. And, and I think, you know, some of the things that our staff have done really well, but I think things that we always continue to need to focus on is how do we continue to remove those barriers to care that exist? We think that they don't um, because everybody's trying so hard, but they do. And how do we reflect upon that and to can you continue to grow um, and challenge some of those assumptions that we have about how we offer services? So I think those are some of our learnings that, uh, you know, we have to continue to sort of dig into. What do you think your experiences over the course of the pandemic say about the ability of community health centers to adapt to emerging social and public health issues and the importance of CHCs with our health and social service systems? I think that's a great question. I would say that our, you know, as a CHC in terms of what we've been able to offer and navigate through COVID the past couple of years has been really remarkable. Um, I think our ability to connect with public health in a meaningful way and, and look at how we can coordinate and collaborate around care. So COVID vaccinations, for example, as I mentioned earlier, has, you know, is really important. And I think, you know, as a community health center, we've been true to our vision, mission and values and really, you know, used, you know, a health equity impact assessment framework to guide some of our decision making, even in initially in terms of when we thought we started thinking about what services do we close, not close, adapt, change, shift, where do we go? So just really using that as a framework was really helpful for us. I think, you know, an interprofessional model of care that really does focus on um, the whole health and wellness of individuals is is really important and continuing to invest in a CHC model and, and models of care that really look at all those aspects of individuals is um, really important, I think, from a, you know, not only a provincial, but a, a federal funding uh, aspect. And I think uh, as well, our um, experiences of really recognizing how many individuals are isolated and very quickly and become compromised very quickly uh, through a pandemic, I think is, I don't know if I would say it's surprising, uh, but I think it's just sort of shed light on how we have many individuals in our community who are just so close to being very vulnerable very quickly. And I think that, um, you know, our capacity to, as a community health center to really respond in creative ways and to try and meet those needs um, in a way that's respectful of, you know, the individual and what they're asking and has been really important and really listening to them around what they need is, um, you know, some things that we've really learned and been able to respond to as a community health center. Vanita, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Um, one last question is if anyone wanted to learn more about Norwest Community Health Centers, where could they find more information? Yeah, so we have a website and it's www.norwestchc.org. And then we also, uh, if you look for us on Facebook or Instagram, you can put Norwest Community Health Centers in there. And that's uh, also a location where you can see some of the some of the work that we're doing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to Community Matters, a podcast from the Canadian Association of Community Health Centres. To learn more about our association and the important work of community health centres across Canada, go to www.cachc.ca.